The 3 Series has long been the benchmark in the compact luxury sedan segment, not because the 3 Series is the best at everything, but because the 3 Series is a very, very well-rounded luxury car. When designing competitors in this segment, manufacturers have often not competed directly with the 3 Series, but instead tried to pick off certain customers. For instance, the Cadillac ATS is one of the best handling vehicles in this segment, and the suspension dynamics really are very, very good, but it falls down in a number of other ways. Luxury on the inside, overall rear seat room, etc. But the Genesis G70 really is different, because during my time with this vehicle, I've come to realize that this is just about as well-rounded as a 3 Series, and it has been designed in a very similar vein. The G70 doesn't stick out in some categories. It's not the fastest entry in the segment. It's not the most efficient entry in the segment. It's not the most luxurious entry in the segment. But like the 3 Series, it does everything very well. Up front, we find the sort of restrained and elegant styling that you expect out of a luxury car. Nothing controversial is going on up front like we see, for instance, in the Lexus IS with that very dramatic swooshy front end. Instead, we get shapes that are very familiar to luxury car buyers. We get a bold grille right there, normally shaped headlamps, we have turn signals down below to give it a little bit of different style, and some chrome treatments that are blacked out in the model that we're driving right here. Instead of trying to give us a vehicle that was a half step larger, like the Infiniti Q50 or the Acura TLX, Genesis decided to put the G70 right in the middle of this segment at 184.4 inches long. That is about 3 inches shorter than the all new S60, which really is pushing the boundaries of this segment as well, but it is almost exactly the same size as the brand new 2019 3 Series that we haven't been able to drive or see yet. This is about 2 inches longer than the current 2018 3 Series. The extra room that we see in the G70 versus something like the Cadillac ATS can be seen right back here in the rear passenger compartment where we definitely get more legroom than we find in the shorter entries. The restrained styling continues out back where we find combination tail lamp modules, LED brake lights and these accent strips but incandescent bulbs for the turn signal that you see over there on that side and the backup light right down there below. I do like the fact that we have an amber turn signal here rather than the red turn signals that we see in some of the competition. I think it actually makes the rear end look a little bit better and it's better at signaling your intent to other drivers. We have well integrated exhaust tips down below and then some arrow treatments right there along the bottom. Like the European entries in this segment, but again a little bit different than some of the other alternatives, we find an all turbocharged engine lineup under this hood. Things start out with a four cylinder, two liter turbo. It produces 252 horsepower and 260 pound feet of torque. That's the only engine available with a manual transmission. You can get a six speed manual that was basically borrowed out of the old Hyundai Genesis Coupe, although it has been tweaked and reworked for use in this particular vehicle. Most versions you'll find on the dealer lots, however, will have an eight speed automatic standard. Then we have this engine right here, which is a 3.3 liter twin turbo V6. It produces 365 horsepower and 376 pound-feet of torque. This is basically the same turbo engine that we find under the hoods of the Genesis G80 and G90. This is mated only to an 8-speed automatic transmission. Fuel economy varies based on whether you choose the manual transmission, the automatic transmission, rear wheel drive, or all wheel drive. And yes, I said rear wheel drive because that is another one of the defining features about the G70 that differentiates this from the TLX, the S60, etc. This is a rear wheel drive sedan. The least efficient version would be the 3.3 liter twin turbo V6 with all wheel drive that'll get you 20 miles per gallon that is below the competition from Europe. If you want to get the two liter turbo that is going to be the most efficient but only with the automatic 25 miles per gallon in rear wheel drive form. If you choose the manual then things actually drop down to 22 miles per gallon which is an awful lot closer to what we're driving right here. The model that we're testing this week is the 3.3 liter twin turbo in rear wheel drive format, which is probably the most fun way to buy your G70. Front seat comfort is good in the G70. I'm actually going to give this one 9 out of 10 points in this segment after having spent a week with it. It is a little bit more comfortable than I initially thought it was at the original vehicle launch. That's thanks to the way that this particular seat adjusts. We have inflatable side bolsters, four-way adjustable lumbar support, and extending thigh cushion that definitely makes it more comfortable for taller drivers, and then a powered tilt telescopic steering column that is memory linked and has a decent range of motion. Now, unlike many of the European luxury competition, the passenger seat does not have the same range of motion as the driver's seat. It is lacking the power extending thigh section and the inflatable bolsters, but it does get the four-way adjustable lumbar. There are definitely more comfortable seats in this segment. For instance, the seats in the brand new Volvo S60 
are more comfortable if you pay for the top end seat package. We do have available seat massage in those seats and the overall design is more comfortable, but you'll definitely pay more for those seats than what we find in this particular model. Hopping into the back seat, that score falls down to 8 out of 10 points. And remember that these scores are only applicable within the segment. So I'm not talking about 8 out of 10 points versus the next category, which would be the G80. You can see that I have a relatively generous amount of legroom here. Legroom is actually very good for this segment, and it's actually very close to the new Volvo S60, which is impressive but headroom is definitely more limited than some of the other options. It's definitely below the C-Class, the 3 Series, the A, 4, etc. If I try and lean my head back here towards the headrest, I do have to crane my head to one side. Now, if you're a shorter person than I am, these seats are going to be very, very comfortable because the overall seat design is comfortable, but remember that headroom is a little bit more limited. If I try to move over to the right side of the vehicle, I can't because this front seat is all the way back in its tracks. Remember that this is still a compact luxury car. Now, a handy touch here is that we actually have little seat controls available here on the front passenger seat, so that way the rear person can actually move that seat a little bit further forward. Now, it's also worth noting that the front seats move a little bit further rearward than many of the other alternatives in the segment. So if you have very long legs and you're a driver or a front passenger, then this may actually be a better alternative than some of those European options. Because as we've seen in other Hyundai vehicles and Genesis vehicles, the front seat tracks are very long and it allows those front seats to move quite a bit rearward compared to some of the competition. Rear seat passengers get air vents right back there in the center console, a USB charge only port, and then we have a fold down center armrest with no storage area, but two cup holders. The model that we're testing this week has the available three-stage heated rear seats. And then you can see that the attention to detail and build quality back here is just about the same as we find on the front doors. Again, bearing in mind that this is a compact vehicle, not a mid-sized vehicle, we find a fairly compact trunk right back here at 10.5 cubic feet of capacity. That is a little bit below the 3 Series, but quite similar to the new Cadillac ATS, and unfortunately not really that far off the new Volvo S60 either, which comes in at 12 cubic feet. You can fit just about the same number of bags back here as in that new S60. If we lift up the load floor, we find some additional storage space in this divider and a tire mobility kit. Now, on first glance, it may look like this is shaped so you could put a compact spare tire back here if you wanted to, but if we dig a little bit further, you'll actually find the battery right back there, just like we find in the European competition. As we look around the interior, the model that we are driving is the Dynamic Edition with the 3.3 liter twin turbo. You can see that we have a pretty standard sized moonroof right there over the driver and front passenger's heads. Not a panoramic variety that we do find in some of the competition. The driver and front passenger get height adjustable shoulder belts, and the model that we're driving has leather upholstery with this contrasting red stitching. The red stitching continues down the seat where we find a quilted center section and then more of that accent along the sides. As you'd expect in a sporty vehicle, we have fairly aggressive side bolstering there, again adjustable via those controls, but not on the passenger side, just on the driver's side. Over on the front doors, we find a combination of stitched materials, soft plastics, and hard plastics. You find those hard plastics down lower on the door, just as we find in most entries in this segment. Our model has the Lexicon sound system, so we find three speakers on the door, one right there by the handle, one with the Lexicon logo right there, and then another one right down there at the very bottom of the door. The red stitching continues as we move on over to the dashboard. The upper section of the dashboard is actually an injection molded component that's been after stitched to make it look like separate pieces. We find that a lot in the luxury segment. And then this center section right here is actually multiple pieces of material that have been stitched together. Below that, we find a pretty typical sized glove compartment for the segment. It is a bin style glove compartment, and I was not able to fit a large tablet computer inside, but smaller ones might fit. In the middle of the dashboard, we find the infotainment and navigation system, the start stop button, and then two air vents. The infotainment system runs basically the same software that we see in Hyundai's mainline vehicles. It's very similar to what we see in the larger Genesis vehicles as well, only we don't have a control knob, we just have the touch screen in the G70. It's very easy to use. We have factory navigation over here in this particular model. Everything is very intuitive and very snappy. We also have full smartphone integration, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto both, unlike some of the other car companies that just support one. A common question that a number of you were asking over at facebook.com slash alexandautos was, how do I feel about the fact that this system is basically using the same software as other Hyundai vehicles? I actually think that's an asset to the Genesis, and here's why. If you take a look at vehicles like the Alfa Romeo lineup or Jaguar Land Rover products, 
products from companies that produce a very small number of vehicles. They just don't have the resources to make software that is snappy and works well and is fully featured. It generally tends to be laggier and buggier than what we see, for instance, in here. We're actually in Maserati products, which use Chrysler infotainment systems as well. So for this vehicle, I actually think this is an asset. Moving down below the infotainment system and air vents, we find the power and volume knob, and then some direct access buttons for those system features. It's another handy feature here in the system is not everything is touch driven. We do have physical buttons for some of these features. We then find the controls for the two zone automatic climate control system, a few direct access buttons to those features as well. So you don't have to use that infotainment screen for that. Below the climate controls, we have a storage area where we find a USB input, 12 volt power port, and the auxiliary input for the system. Now, unfortunately, some of the larger smartphones will not fit in that tray while the USB cord is connected, but you can leave them in there with the Qi wireless charging happening. The downside to this, of course, is that you can't use Apple CarPlay in this vehicle without having it connected via that USB connector. The shifter is one of the electronic joystick variety, so I push this button right over here, pull back for drive, push forward to reverse, and it always returns to center. If you wanna park, you just simply press that button right in front. Behind the shifter, we have the drive mode selector dial. This allows us to toggle between custom, sport, comfort, eco, and smart mode that controls a variety of different vehicle functions based on the options you have in your G70. There's a parking sense enable disable button right here, auto brake hold enable disable, the traction control right over there that also disables stability control if you hold it down, and a button to enable and disable the 360 degree camera system as well as the electric rear parking brake. We then have two large cup holders over to the right. These are very large and easily able to accommodate large takeout drinks. It's a little bit different than we find in some of the European luxury stands which really do have kind of wimpy cup holders. Moving over to the instrument cluster, we have four physical gauges, including a large speedometer and large tachometer. Then everything else is being delivered by a large multifunction LCD in the middle. This displays where you'll find some additional gauge readouts like oil temperature, torque, turbo pressure, etc. We have a G-force gauge right there and a lap timer. You'll also get your pretty typical trip computer readouts, turn-by-turn -turn navigation directions for the factory navigation system only, not CarPlay or Android Auto. We also get some additional readouts for the vehicle's active safety systems, driver attention warning, etc., and then the ability to change certain vehicle settings. The steering wheel is a round design with a large Genesis logo right there on the airbag cover. We have sport grips up top and again, more of that red stitching going on. On the left side of the steering wheel, we find the controls for the infotainment system along with dedicated phone buttons. There's a voice command button and then a mode change button right there. And then on the right side of the wheel, we find the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control system over here. And then this dial, OK button, and then this button right here, control that multifunction display between the speedometer and tachometer. Now this roller dial right here, it is a little bit tricky to navigate some of those functions. I kind of wish it had been a toggle rather than the roller. On the back of the wheel, we have shift paddles up on the right and then down over here on the left. They do move with the steering wheel, which is my preference. The first thing you'll really notice about the G70 out on the road is that this is just a well-rounded vehicle overall, very much again like the BMW 3 Series. In our acceleration tests, this model ran from 0 to 60 in 4.6 seconds. That is very good, very similar to the BMW 340i. It's not the fastest in this segment, but it's not the slowest either, and this is notably quicker than something like the IS350 or the naturally aspirated engine options that we see in some of the competition. The zero to 60 time surprised me just a little bit because I actually expected this rear wheel drive model to be a little bit slower in our testing. This got the exact same zero to 60 score that the all wheel drive model got when we last tested it out in New Hampshire. I think the difference is that that car was being tested at a higher altitude and it was also hotter out there because the rear wheel drive model does have a little bit of a grip issue like you'd expect in a two wheel drive vehicle. I suspect that if we were testing the all wheel drive model out here in California, that that model would be a little bit faster than this. Likewise, our braking score is good for this segment, but not the absolute best at 113 feet. That is definitely a very respectable score, very similar to most versions of the BMW 340i yet again. The G70 is an awful lot of fun to drive hard out on your favorite winding mountain road, and this has those solid rear wheel drive dynamics that you'd expect out of a performance luxury vehicle. This feels very different than something like an Acura TLX or the Volvo S60. It also feels very different than something like an Audi S4, because the Audi A4 and S4 have a lot more weight on their front axle. By their very design, the Quattro system that we find in the A4, A5, A6, A7, and A8 puts the entire engine in front of the front axle. So the bigger the engine, the more unbalanced that weight ends up being. 
The G70, on the other hand, much like the C-Class and the 3 Series, has a near-perfect 50-50 weight balance. And in neutral handling situations, that is really obvious. When you're accelerating, weight balance is a little bit less important. But if you lift your foot off the accelerator and you're going around a corner and there's no power going on, neutral handling, that's when you're really going to notice the different balance that we find in these vehicles. But I actually think that the overall suspension dynamics in the G70 are superior to what we find in the 3 Series. The 3 Series is getting a little old. It is being replaced for 2019, so we do expect some improvements there. But compared to the current generation model, I actually like the way this suspension is tuned overall. This reminds me a little bit more of the Jaguar XE and, of course, the Lexus IS. The Lexus IS has a very precise feel to it. Unfortunately, the IS is also fairly slow because we don't get nearly as much power out of its engine lineup as we find here in the G70. So in some ways, this combines the best aspects of those German entries and the best aspects of the Lexus IS. Now, overall steering feel still isn't where I would want it to be, but that's just thanks to the electric power steering systems that we find in all modern luxury cars. You aren't really going to find more steering feel in any of the other options out there, although the Alfa Romeo Giulia is probably the best in this segment. Therefore, it shouldn't really be a surprise that when it comes to our overall handling score, I'm going to give this model an A. The model that we're driving does have the optional adaptive suspension system, so this does a better job than the base models at handling rougher roads like the gravel road that we're on right here. Of course, if I turn the drive mode dial to the sport setting, then things do firm up a little bit and we get more of those noticeable road imperfections into the cabin. In terms of overall ride quality, this is very, very comparable to the 3 Series. It's a little bit firmer than most versions of the C-Class, and I would say it's actually a little bit softer than something like the Cadillac ATS or certain versions of the Jaguar XF. This is definitely a solid middle-of-the-road style suspension. In our cabin noise test at 50 miles an hour, this vehicle scored 70 decibels, which is very good for this segment, so I'm going to give that an A as well. You will find some slightly quieter models from the competition, but they're not going to be too much quieter than what we're driving right here. The only real area where the G70 falls down versus the European competition is fuel economy. We've been averaging about 19.9 miles per gallon, which is a little bit lower than the EPA says we should get. Now, of course, we have been driving this pretty hard during our time with the car, and this is an awful lot of fun, so it does factor into the overall fuel economy score, but you should expect that this is going to be below the 340i probably even below the C43 AMG in terms of overall fuel efficiency. This is definitely going to slot below something like the new Volvo S60 T8. The S60 T8 gives us better performance than this, and it gives us vastly improved fuel economy, but overall handling ability is very, very different in that car. Even if you're taking a look at something like the Polestar engineered version of the S60, it is not going to handle like the G70. The G70 not only has that strong rear wheel drive dynamic that is more fun, a little bit more capable out on a track, but the overall levels of grip are just vastly superior here because this is considerably lighter than that plug-in hybrid. Now we should talk about the elephant in the room, which is how this drives versus the Kia Stinger. A lot of you over on Facebook were asking about that question particularly. The G70 was designed to be a very direct BMW 3 Series competitor, a solid luxury performance compact sedan, whereas the Kia Stinger really was, as the trim level indicates, designed to be more of a Gran Turismo style ride, something that was a little bit softer but still handled very well. So when you get the vehicles out on a winding road like we're on right here, you'll immediately notice the difference. The Stinger feels like it has a little bit of rear end lift when you really start pushing it hard in the corners. We don't find that at all in the G70. The Stinger is also tuned a little bit differently, a little bit softer, so it feels heavier out on the road, even though the curb weight difference is not as large as you might think. The Stinger was just tuned to feel like a bigger car out on the road. Some people like that, some people don't. If you like that larger feel, get the Stinger. If you don't, get the G70. In terms of overall performance, the two vehicles are very, very similar, whether you're talking about the 2-liter turbo or the 3.3-liter 6, because the curb weight is not different enough to really have a huge impact on overall performance. So 4.6 seconds, 0 to 60 in this car. Oddly enough, 4.6 seconds also in the Stinger. Overall steering feel is definitely very similar, but there seems to be a little bit more precision here in the G70 than we find in the Stinger. I'm not sure why that is, because there are a number of components that are directly shared, and I suspect that the steering rack is one of them. In a nutshell, when you drive the two vehicles back to back, you'll immediately notice that they're related, but you'll also immediately notice that they're tuned differently, and differently enough to appeal to different kinds of shoppers.
Before we talk directly about pricing, we need to discuss the dealer network for Genesis. This is important to understand. At this exact moment in time when I'm recording this video, there are only about 45 Genesis dealers in America. That's because Hyundai and Genesis really decided to split things and make things very firm and delineated between the two brands. 2018 Genesis models were sold at Hyundai dealers that had a Genesis showroom within them. 2019 Genesis models can only be sold at a dedicated Genesis dealer that has a new franchise agreement with Hyundai, totally separate finances with the Hyundai side of things. Now they could coexist, a Hyundai dealer could sign a new agreement to sell Genesis vehicles as well on the same theoretical dealer lot, but they would have to sign that entirely new agreement. And that's why at the moment, there are no franchise dealers that can sell 2019 Genesis models in California, Texas, Florida, Oregon, Washington, and a number of other key states. Hopefully this will all get resolved by the end of 2018, but at the time I'm recording this video, it has not been resolved yet, so do keep that in mind. With that out of the way, let's get into the pricing. The Genesis is priced very aggressively, whether you're comparing it to a BMW 3 Series or even something like an Acura TLX. It starts at $34,900 for the base 2.0-liter turbo engine. That base model gets you an 8-speed automatic transmission and rear-wheel drive. If you want the manual transmission, that's actually not a base model. That is sort of the next step up in the lineup. That's the sport trim for $37,900. But personally, I wouldn't get the manual transmission because it is going to be a little bit slower and a little bit less efficient than the 8-speed auto. And the 8-speed is actually a pretty decent transmission all the way around. If you want the 3.3-liter twin-turbo V6, which is what we were driving, that starts at $43,750 for 2019. All-wheel drive brings you up to $45,750. And if you want all of the options on your G70, you'll top out right at around $51,005. That is significantly less expensive than top-end trims from most of the competition. Our first competitor is the Lexus IS, which I think is one of the most natural competitors to the Genesis. Because the Genesis reminds me an awful lot of what I think that the Lexus IS could have or should have been in this particular generation. Because Lexus really chose with this generation of the IS to not really directly compete with the Germans. We find only one turbocharged engine in that model. It's the base trim for 38,310. And that base turbocharged engine is not terribly powerful. So overall performance actually is a little bit behind what we see in the base Genesis model. And then from that point on up in the Lexus lineup, we see some other unusual choices. For instance, if you want to add all wheel drive, then you actually move on over to a V6 engine instead of the two liter turbo, but you also move down from the eight speed automatic to a six speed automatic. Part of that is because the IS is one of the older entries in this particular segment. We do expect to see Lexus redesign this vehicle at some point, but we don't know exactly when, and it's not likely going to be for 2020. If you want all of the options in your IS, you'll end up at around 52,795, but you won't get nearly the same level of performance that we find in the Genesis G70, or actually most of the competition, because most of the competition now gives you a twin turbo six cylinder engine or a single turbo six cylinder engine in the top end trim. So the BMW, the Mercedes, the Audi, uh, even the Volvo has a high horsepower engine option, although they don't give you six cylinders, we definitely get more power than we find in that top-end Lexus IS. Moving on to the 3 Series, the story here really is about value. A new 3 Series is coming soon, so be sure and keep that in mind. We're talking about the 2018 3 Series, not the brand new 2019 3 Series, because we haven't been able to drive it yet, and it's not on sale in the US at the time that we're filming this video. The 3 Series is definitely gonna be more expensive when you consider the amount of feature content we get in that model. $34,900 buys you the base 320i, but that model was really designed to compete against the Audi A3, the Mercedes-Benz CLA, and other smaller compact and subcompact options from the competition. Instead of making a smaller sedan to compete with the entry-level models from the competition, BMW chose to put a less powerful engine in the base BMW and sell it for less to directly compete with those. That's why the 330i is really the more natural competitor to the G70. And when you take a look at that model versus the base G70, you'll notice what's going on here. The G70 is significantly less expensive. From that point, we move on up to the 340i, which starts at 48,950, well above the base 3.3 liter twin turbo that we see in the Genesis. On the surface of things, it appears that the Genesis should be significantly faster than the 3 Series when you're talking about the top end engines. But in reality, the BMW really holds its own. That's A, because BMW is really lying about their power output and that engine is making more power than they're claiming. 
and B, because Genesis seems to be favoring reliability and limiting torque a little bit in first gear. That's the only way we can seem to explain the acceleration figures that we find in first gear versus second gear. Once you get into second gear, acceleration really improves in the G70. Now the two vehicles are actually very similar in terms of overall 0 to 60 scores, with the rear wheel drive G70 and rear wheel drive 340i being relatively similar, and the all wheel drive models being relatively similar with one another as well. As I said at the beginning of the video, when you drive the G70 and the 3 Series back to back, it's really obvious that Genesis was trying to do basically the same thing as BMW in this segment, rather than trying to march to a slightly different drummer as other manufacturers have. They're trying to give us excellent legroom, excellent headroom, a well-rounded, well-appointed interior, a lot of the features that you expect in this segment, while at the same time delivering driving precision that is one of the best in this particular segment, and also acceleration. Because again, those are combinations that we haven't seen from all of the competitors in the segment. Cadillac, Lexus, Infiniti, etc. They've all tried to target the core models in the segment with a, a slightly different theme, but that's not what we see with the Genesis G70. That's possibly because Genesis was able to hire away some engineers from some of the European manufacturers, and I suspect that they were really targeting this very mainstream benchmark in the segment quite directly. A good example of the differing missions would be the Infiniti Q50, which has long been one of the value alternatives in this segment. The Q50 is sort of a half step larger, and that's why we have a little bit more room on the inside, and that's why the Q50 feels a little bit different than a 3 Series. It feels a little bit bigger out on the road, it feels a little bit heavier. Base models of the Q50 are also a little bit slower, because Infiniti doesn't give us as much power. They're using a 2 liter Mercedes engine, and that base model, it produces 208 horsepower, but the Q50 is a little bit bigger and a little bit heavier than the competition, and that's why it feels a little bit sluggish in that particular model. Although Infiniti generally has more cash on the hood available, the MSRP of the Q50 is actually a little bit higher, at $35,550 for that base model. From that point on, Infiniti actually has two different twin-turbo V6s. They have a 300 horsepower version, and then they have a 400 horsepower version. The 300 horsepower 3.0T starts less than the Genesis 3.3 at $38,300, but isn't as quick 0 to 60. The Red Sport 400 is an interesting twist in this segment because it produces more power than a lot of the other options, but because of the overall gearing and because of traction in that particular model, especially the rear-wheel drive trim, it doesn't end up being notably faster than the rear-wheel drive Genesis G70. Now let's move on to another brand new entry for 2019, the Volvo S60. With the S60, Volvo is definitely marching to a different drummer in this particular segment. It's almost as if Volvo looked at the benchmark in this segment, the 3 Series, and said, never mind, we're going to do our own thing here. Now, on the one hand, that is definitely refreshing, but on the other hand, there are some reasons that we have benchmarks in particular segments. The S60 really excels when it comes to luxury amenities, overall interior comfort, and interior room. It has a very, very roomy cabin, big back seat, relatively generous trunk, and overall, a very, very luxurious and comfortable cabin. But in terms of overall driving dynamics, because it's marching to a different drummer, it's not as engaging. $35,800 buys you the base front-wheel drive T5 engine in the S60, and that is definitely going to be slower 0 to 60 than the base G70 model. The hybrid model is another good example of where the S60 is marching to a different drummer, because Volvo's solution to improve performance in the S60 was to add a plug-in hybrid system on top of the existing supercharger and the existing turbocharger, so there's a lot going on in that model. Now, on the other hand, it does get you excellent fuel economy, some of the best fuel economy we get in this particular segment. We also get the plug-in hybrid tax credit, depending on your particular tax situation, and again, one of the most luxurious and best interiors in this particular segment. But you'll definitely have to pay for that, because if you get all the premium options in your S60, it will end up costing you about $13,000 to $14,000 more than the most expensive trim of the G70. The G70 is definitely a solid entry in the luxury compact sedan category, and it's a model that has really reinvented value, because up till this point, a lot of the value options in this segment weren't really mainstream entries. So we had the Q50 that's a good value, but it's a half step larger, it feels a little bit bigger out on the road. We have value entries like the Lexus IS, arguably against the BMW 3 Series, but then it lacks the thrust that we find in the 3 Series or the Audi lineup. 
Or we have entries like the Acura TLX, which is definitely a strong value in this segment, but it gives up overall handling and overall performance compared to its European counterparts. But that's not a compromise that we see in the Genesis G70. It really blends a lot of the things that I like about the competitive vehicles with the solid rear wheel drive dynamics that you'd expect out of this particular category. So we have handling precision that we would expect out of a European entry, but we have likely the reliability that we would expect out of a Japanese entry. We have the room inside the cabin that you'd find in a larger value entry, but the G70 is still sized like a 3 Series and it still drives like a 3 Series, so it doesn't feel overly large out on the road. All that together makes the G70 really an excellent value in this particular segment. Of course, there are a ton of entries in this segment as well, and the G70 is coming at a time where sedan sales are sliding. So I'd love to know what you think about that down there in the comments section below. Although I think the G70 is one of the best values in this segment, and overall actually one of the best cars in this segment, period, is it relevant in this segment, or should Genesis really have just spent their money on bringing out a compact crossover? Now personally, I love sedans more than crossovers, so I think the G70 was definitely money well spent, but I want to know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. Click on those related videos if you haven't already done so, click up there to the top of your screen if you want to support this channel, and as always, find us over at facebook.com slash alexnautos. I'll see you next week.